Hey, hi, hello everybody, hello, hello. <laughs> Welcome back. Today I'm taking on probably one of my most ambitious videos in a very long time. I've got two drinks today. I've got a bucket of coffee in this Go Away I'm Reading mug, which I adore. And I've got some cucumber lime water because it's, this is gonna be a doozy. Today we are talking about the evolution of Cassandra Clare. I was really interested in Cassandra Clare's career because I kind of knew a little bit about the beginnings of her career, but not a ton. I've read the three main completed Shadowhunters series that are out right now. I haven't read a lot of the side books or anything that deviate like the short story collections or anything like that. So yes, I have a little bit of Cassandra Clare under my belt, but I'm not a diehard fan and and I just wanted to make that clear at the start of this video. I tried to be as neutral as possible. However, just because I'm not the biggest fan and have not read every single one of her works does not mean that Cassandra Clare is not successful. She is actually a massive success in the YA young adult literature genre and she's about to branch out into adult literature. She has had a movie and a TV show based on her series. So that all got me wondering on ruminating on her and where she came from and also what I think is gonna happen in the future. Cassandra Clare is actually a pen name. She was born Judith Rumelt in 1973 in Iran and she spent the majority of her childhood traveling around Europe before settling with her family in Los Angeles, California, United States to go to high school. After graduation and in her early adult life she spent she split her time between Los Angeles where she went to high school and New York City. She worked as a reporter during this time where she was split in New York City and LA as a reporter for various kind of gossip tabloid and entertainment magazines and most notably she wrote for The Hollywood Reporter. In August of 2000 she while still living in Los Angeles she sat down to to write her very first fan fiction under the pen name Cassandra Clare and a notable difference here is she spells Clare C-L-A-I-R-E in her pen name for fan fiction. So none of her fan fiction is currently available on the original site. You can find some of her more famous work as PDFs on the internet but according to fanlore.org, which is kind of like a Wikipedia for fan culture, she wrote fan fiction between the years 2000 and 2006. Claire focused mostly on Harry Potter fan fiction, but she did write a very popular Lord of the Rings fan fiction called The Very Secret Diaries, which I believe was were first person diary entries kind of like Bridget Jones's diary from the characters perspectives in the Fellowship of the Ring and it was very well received among the Lord of the Rings fan fiction community. Claire actually said on her origins of writing fan fiction in an interview on a podcast. Welcome to the Slashcast Insider interview. I'm Emma Grant and my guest today is Cassie Claire. She's one of the best known writers in the fandom for her Draco trilogy, which she's bringing to a close soon after six years. She's a professional writer in her real life, and the first installment of her Mortal Instruments trilogy will be available in bookstores early in 2007. Welcome, Cassie. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for being interviewed. I know that you're really busy. Yeah, I'm really excited to be interviewed. This is really cool. Good. Well, let's just start off with the story of how you came to be a fan fiction writer. Oh, that's a tough one. I was aware of fan fiction because I'd actually been asked to do an article on the X-Files fandom. And so I was researching online and I came across Gossamer, which was the biggest X-Files archive at that time. And I spent like three weeks at work just reading all the stories and being like, wow, people really like, they put a lot of work into this. <laughs> you know, this is amazing. They're offering all this, you know, amusement for free. And then I didn't think about it again for a long time. And after I read the Harry Potter books, my best friend was heading off to medical school. And I asked her if there was anything I could do to amuse her while she was there being tortured by uh, the professors. And she said she would like me to write her first story about Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy and how they switched places. And that became the Draco Trilogy, which oh, wow. I 
wrote for her, and then she said, you should put this up online somewhere. So I did. It was like the first three or four chapters at that point. Wow. Was that the first, so that was the first piece of fan fiction that you ever wrote? Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd never I interacted with any fan community. I didn't know anyone who wrote fan fiction. It was a complete mystery to me. I found fanfiction.net by Googling, and I just put it there because I was trying to find a place that had an easy upload interface. And there were no Harry Potter archives at the time, at least none that I found. So that quote kind of is indicative of what Cassandra Clare mostly wrote in fan fiction. She mostly focused on Harry Potter fan fiction and that the relationship that she wrote about were between Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy. We will get to Cassandra Clare's most famous, most well-known fan fiction in a second, but I do want to pause here and point out that she did write a Ron slash Ginny incest fan fiction called Mortal Instruments in 2004. Just something to file away uh, uh, for a little bit later on in this video. But by far Cassandra Clare's most popular, most well-known work was called the Draco Trilogy. The Draco Trilogy consists of Draco Dormians, Dormians, Draco Sinister, and Draco Veritas. And it was published in parts by Cassandra Clare between the years 2000 and 2006. Each installment is super long and could be its own novel and they continuously get longer and longer as the series goes on. Here's some author summaries about what these are. For Draco Dormians, the first in the trilogy, when an accident in potions class turns Harry into Draco and Draco into Harry, each is trapped playing the part of the other. Romance, mistaken identities, really cunning plans all in capitals, evil bake sales, a love triangle, and snogs galore. For the second one, when Hermione is kidnapped, Harry and Draco must team up to rescue her from a thousand-year-old evil that threatens the entire wizarding world. Cursed demon swords, love potions, time travel, dementors, flying dragons, Draco wears leather, and everybody dies at least once, except when they don't. And finally, the sequel to the first two, featuring Winter at Hogwarts, Snogging, Quidditch, Mysterious Things, and Rysen Malfoy. I have no idea what that means. And I actually did toy a little bit with reading these fan fictions just to see what they were about, but they're available as PDFs, and the first one is 207 page PDF file. The second one is 996 pages. And the last one is 1,697 page PDF. And I actually found that equals about 540,000 words. And I'm sorry, I am not that dedicated. I am not that committed to Draco Harry Ginny fan fiction. <laughs> and it is important to note here that even though Claire is taking the story from J.K. Rowling. Her characters, and many people say this throughout, her characters and her characterizations are drastically different from the original work. Draco is a sexy, brooding, leather-wearing bad boy, and that is what this trilogy focuses on that characterization. It's definitely a version of Draco that makes people and readers more sympathetic towards him. So she definitely took that and ran with it and kind of made him her own character because we really don't see a ton of Draco in the original series. What the, we're, we're looking at Draco more as an anti-hero in these fan fictions. In my research, there are some people that say this was Cassandra Clare's like original character. She invented this version of Draco and others say she just popularized it. I'm not really sure where I stand because I haven't read the fan fictions. I don't think it's too far of a leap to go to take what we got because we got so little of Draco, especially in some of the uh, earlier books, to take that and turn him into a misunderstood sexy bad boy, in my opinion. I actually found a quote from somebody, I think, in an article. I will try my best to leave all my sources down below. I read so many articles. So one fan writes, the Draco trilogy did not invent fan and Draco, but it is tremendous. It's tremendous fame popularized him and gave him his most recognizable traits, sex and snark. Here Draco is a redeemed figure whose relationship with Harry Potter is at, at times almost symbiotic. The story itself draws massive popularity from the underlying Harry Draco subtext. Despite its multiplicity of 
heterosexual pairings and is probably single-handedly responsible for the fact that most Draco fans are also Harry Draco's shippers. So this version of Draco was widely appreciated and popularized and according to fanlore.org her fans were extremely numerous. Mailing lists and rec lists had many references to her genius, her writing skill, and her humor, and it wasn't unusual for her fans to refer to her as a goddess. And I can't understate how popular that Cassandra Clare was in this space. She was so popular that she was actually part of this group deemed the Inner Circle, which was composed of bigger named fans that within the Harry Potter community that were the most famous, famous, famous. I mean, she garnered a lot of attention. I kind of equate it to being like Tumblr famous, where you have a lot of people following you, but it's not really like outwardly famous, if that makes sense. According to the Miss Scribe story, an unauthorized fandom biography, the inner circle was a all caps big deal quote every little fandom newbie who joined fiction alley which was where claire was posting her works at this point wanted to be part of the inner circle the legendary group of friends and fiction alley mods who supposedly ran everything decided what was in and what was out and got to be personal friends with the coolest of cool the famous of the famous the best of the best cassandra claire it's hard for kids today to realize how big cassandra claire was back then i'm telling you she was big way bigger than any big name fan could possibly be now she was colossal so I just think she was she was very popular she was very well loved and popular and kind of at the top of the fan fiction pyramid at this point so Cassandra Clare also states she thought the Draco trilogy was her best work but she does state that she experimented a lot in her writing while writing the Draco trilogy she would write in different voices and in different styles to see what works and what doesn't work and I think that prepared her to be the author that she is today however being that famous and that popular does not come without your fair share of controversies. Throughout her time writing fanfiction, there were several accusations of plagiarism in her work. Some fans of the Draco trilogy started to notice that there were direct quotes pulled from popular TV shows at the time, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and some other works. And those quotes were used in Cassandra Clare's Draco trilogy. Apparently these were intentional on Clare's part and she actually put disclaimers when she uploaded her fan fiction that she would kind of play this find the quote game with her readers and put stuff in there intentionally as kind of nods to inspiration or things she found funny, etc. Regardless, in 2001, Cassandra Claire's work was banned from fanfiction.net. I believe this was one of the most popular fanfiction sites at the time. It's definitely the first fanfiction site that I had ever heard of. But in 2004, I was not reading fanfiction at the time. I was very young, so I'm not sure. Maybe somebody could tell me down in the comments. She still posted her works to other very popular forums for Harry Potter fanfiction. There were several different sites that would specifically host Harry Potter fanfiction fiction only and so she would still post her work there. And now there are varying levels to the plagiarism in fan fiction isn't all fan fiction plagiarism debate which I do not have time nor do I want to get into right now. Ironically shortly before her own works were banned Cassandra Clare actually thought someone was plagiarizing her own fan fiction. She did post on her live journal, I do hope this is an off topic, but I've just noticed that someone off of fanfiction.net has stolen my identity and is publishing extremely short fake chapters of Draco Sinister. This can't be good, can it? Um, what should I do? Cassie, who cannot believe she is famous enough to be impersonated, which I just think is hilarious and ironic. <laughs> I do want to make a note here that Cassandra Clare started states that she started writing what would become the first book in the Mortal Instruments trilogy and her debut novel City of Bones in 2004. 2006 was a pivotal year in Cassandra Clare's career timeline. In 2006, the Mortal Instruments was bought by Simon & Schuster for a $25,000 advance. And in July of 2006, she actually stated that the Draco trilogy was going to come to an end. I think she wanted to wrap up everything before her book was set to come out that following year. However, the plagiarism 
accusations do not stop. So in 2006, fan fiction user Avocado wrote an expose piece on the plagiarism accusations for Cassandra Clare's works and why she was actually banned from fanfiction.net in 2001. Avocado claimed that several passages, like long passages of the Draco trilogy were lifted straight from this book called The Hidden Land by Pamela Dean. So all of this went down in 2001, these accusations, but Avocado wrote this expose in 2006, I'm guessing because Claire was about to wrap up her trilogy. I'm not really sure why it was waited for so long, but yes, Avocado has this lengthy article where she puts side-by-side -side passages from Cassandra Clare's Draco trilogy and The Hidden Land, and you can see the similarities. I will link them down below. I have neither read the fan fiction nor the Hidden Land by Pamela Dean, so I don't feel comfortable speaking on my opinions on this, but I'll let you figure that out for yourself. I lied. I am going to give you my opinion. Obviously, I don't condone plagiarism of any form. However, I do think that the first half of these accusations, in my opinion, are pretty harmless. In fan fiction, I think it's okay as long as you're throwing in a disclaimer that you're pulling sources of inspiration. I think that's fine. However, just looking at the side-by-sides of the Pamela Dean and the Cassandra Clare, it does seem like she's taking more than just notable quotes from famous TV shows or a famous book and kind of Easter egging them in. So that is a little sus to me. However, I do want to say I have not read the fan fiction in its entirety. I have not read The Hidden Land in its entirety. I'm just comparing these excerpts that were presented to me. Regardless, plagiarism accusations will kind of follow Cassandra Clare for the rest of her career, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. There are also accusations of bullying and bad behavior on Cassandra Clare's part when she was participating in the Harry Potter fan fiction community. However, I tried to parse through some of the discourse, but it's really difficult to kind of tell who's who and figure out a lot of things have been deleted and even parsing through web archive it's really difficult to figure out what was going on and who was talking so I don't want to I don't want to talk on that either but there were some accusations at that point and I don't believe Claire has ever made a statement about it. During this time Claire was still working as a copy editor for the National Enquirer and Star Magazine some of those same kind of tabloids that she was writing for earlier in her career. She is now copy editing and she ended up taking down all of her fan fiction from the various sites that it was published to in preparation for the Mortal Instruments release. At this time she also changed her pen name from Cassandra Clare with an I to Cassandra Clare without an I and Clare has never publicly made a statement on this but some people do speculate it's because of the plagiarism controversy. I, she didn't want people to google her name and find that before they found stuff about her upcoming books. On March 27th 2007 the Mortal Inst the first book in the Mortal Instruments trilogy titled City of Bones was released. City of Bones was published to immense success especially for a debut novel and in April of that year the following month City of Bones hit the New York Times bestselling list at number eight. The book was being hailed as a fun and sprawling urban fantasy adventure series and because it was packed with so many paranormal creatures it was the natural successor to the huge phenomenon of Twilight. Things also heated up even more for Cassandra Clare when Stephanie Meyer recommended the book on her blog and eventually ended up blurbing one of Cassie Clare's book which gave her just even more good press. The rest of the planned trilogies, City of Ashes and City of Glass, were published in succession 2000, in 2008 and 2009. The series was met with even more success and Claire states that after City of Glass was released that she finally quit her copy editing day job and moved to writing full time. Because we are so close to Cassandra Clare's fanfiction writing days, I do want to draw a couple comparisons. So yes, as I mentioned earlier, Claire had a fanfiction titled mortal instruments that was 
clearly one of her most taboo subjects she had ever tackled. Although readers say she did not pull any elements of the story from the fanfiction to City of Bones, I cannot speak on this because I don't want to read the fanfiction. I really don't. Please don't make me. There is a fake incest plot in the City of Bones. So it's really hard not to look at the title of the fanfiction, the plot of the fanfiction, and what happens in City of Bones and think about what was really going on behind the scenes there. So Cassandra Clare actually addresses this in a very long Tumblr post. Again, I'll link it down below if you want to read the entire thing, talking about taboo subjects in her work. And she addresses this in 2014, from what I could tell. I don't know if she had addressed this before then. She may have, but it seems like this is kind of the one-stop shop post that she leads people to whenever they bring up the taboo subject. So she rambles on about cannibalism oddly for a while. I think Hannibal at the time was a very popular show so she was drawing comparisons to that and then she talks about taboo subjects in classic literature, folklore, and things like that of which she draws a lot of inspiration from mythology and folklore so I think she was talking about those things. But the biggest takeaway for me from this post was the intent. She very much in this post is clear that her intent is not to romanticize this taboo subject. And she also made a similar post earlier about the original fan fiction. I don't know how I feel about this because then you just see random tweets like this one that she tweets and it seems like she, I don't, I, it's hard to read the tone of tweets, I'm telling you. So I really don't know where I land on this. I, I want to believe her that her intent is not to romanticize this kind of taboo subject. But when your clearest argument is that it, the book got kicked off of an incest book list on Amazon because it didn't contain any actual incest, uh, I don't really know. Okay, I have more thoughts on this. I apologize for the crappy quality, but I have some questions that I want to pose. So first off, I, I read this series between 2014 and 2015 ish. So most of the books had come out at that time. I think probably all of them in the initial series had come out at that time. So I knew that the Jace Clary brother sister plot line was a twist, a fake twist. It was fake. It was not, they were not really brother and sister. But I am curious for people that read these books as they were coming out, how did you feel? Did you think it was romanticized? Did you think they were brother and sister? And that's how Claire was kind of playing it. I am curious about that because thinking back, and it has been a while since I've read these books, but thinking back, it does feel a little more romanticized than Claire makes it out to be in her Tumblr post. And I just don't think she's as hitting those themes on the head as she likes to think she was when she was writing these books. I also want to pose the question, like, if you do want to explore themes around incest and incestual relationships, is the young adult literature section the right place to do that? I go back and forth on this because I did read things like Oedipus Rex and some of the other um, examples that Claire mentions in her Tumblr post. I did read those in high school and I don't think it's too far out of the realm for teenagers and young adults to grasp themes like that. However, it comes back to is Cassandra Clare really hitting those themes hard? I mean, Oedipus Rex really like drives the nail in the coffin on that one. And does Cassandra Clare do that? I'm not really sure. Let me know your opinions down below. I just want to toss those questions out there and see what you think. Let me know what you guys think down below. This is just, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. This is wild. So there is evidence of people actually calling out Cassandra Clare for the similarities between, not between the original Mortal Instruments fic and the Mortal Instruments City of Bones, but between her most popular work, the Draco trilogy and City of Bones. So I do think that there are some um, the, there is a little bit of merit to this. I think that Jace and the fan fiction Draco mirror each other, Jenny and Clary mirror each other, and there are some other examples of characters in her fic and in 
in the mortal instruments that mirror each other. However, based on what I've seen, Claire in her fan fictions totally reworked every single character so much that they were pretty much unrecognizable from the original characters. So really she was just borrowing traits from herself. That's kind of where I am right now on that. But there are people that say it's just a copy of a copy of a copy. It kind of depends on if you're looking in places for if people are fans, they'll tell you one thing. If they're not fans, they'll tell you another thing. So I just think that's, I just think it's interesting. I think what is more likely is, like Cassandra Clare earlier said, her fan fiction kind of served almost as practice for writing books. So she played around with elements to see what worked and what didn't work and what did work she pulled over to use in the mortal instruments. I don't know, maybe I should read the fan fiction and see what I think. There was an article or an opinion piece by someone who said that the Falcon story was pulled directly from the fan fiction. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not a good reporter. So in 2009, The Mortal Instruments was optioned to be a film. Cassandra Clare sold the film rights to her trilogy. And we move into kind of the first most blissful era for Cassandra Clare in my opinion. So at this time Clare had been hearing that kind of these paranormal romances were dying out and we are seeing a general trend of twilight burnout is what I like to call it but just the oversaturation of these paranormal romances in YA that you know, I think her publishers were warning her that this was not going to make her any more money. The trends were moving more towards books like The Hunger Games and Divergent and these kind of dystopian novels were more what people were picking up. But Claire said she waited after she was told this, she waited for her sales to drop, but they didn't. And she, in 2010, she published the first book in a new trilogy called The Infernal Devices. The title of the first book is Clockwork Angel. This book debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. This was a prequel trilogy to the original Mortal Instruments trilogy, and fans seemed to absolutely love this this book. And at this time it is announced that the Mortal Instruments is going to get a second trilogy making the entire series a six book series. So this is where Cassandra Clare starts writing multiple books in multiple series at the same time. So in 2011 we get the continuation. So this is two to three years after the publishing of City of Glass which was thought to be the finale. We get the extension and City of Fallen Angels is released in in 2011. This was actually received with mixed reception. I think critics felt like it was just a rehash of the original trilogy and because people were so infatuated with Clockwork Angel I don't think City of Fallen Angels was as well received as the other ones. However that didn't stop Cassandra Clare. This is like a smooth wonderful era for her. It's like her first very popular era in my opinion. She's always been popular but this is kind of the trend that I see. She's doing great. She is also, I found this weird article saying Claire is also credited by her publisher with creating the City of Fallen Angels treatment where a tangible letter from one character to another is attached to the back of physical copies of books. To The goal is to spur print book sales. So there was a letter from Jace to Clary in the back of City of Fallen Angels in order to drive book sales up. This was like a new concept at the time. I couldn't really dig too far when I when I googled City of Fallen Angels treatment there's really only one article that mentions this so I don't know I find it hard to believe that Cassandra Clare invented like bonus content but maybe like the tangible I don't know if you could take the letter out and have the letter or things like that but I guess it worked and the publisher was really happy about it and kind of wrote this extra content so things were looking up in 2011 also Claire released the second book in the Infertile Devices, Clockwork Prince, which was received very well as in addition to the first book. In 2012, the fifth book in the Mortal Instruments series, 
City of Lost Souls was, re was released and this was also mixed reception. So we, so Claire had the Infernal Devices which was generally well received and then the second half of the Mortal Instruments was kind of mixed but because they were coming out every other one I think it just worked out perfectly for her. And in 2013, the end to the Infernal Devices trilogy came out, Clockwork Princess, and that was again widely well received. Claire does something wonderful in her finales that just not a lot of other authors could do. And I think at the time there were some disappointing finales in YA coming out. Not a lot of people loved Mockingjay, not a lot of people loved Allegiant, and I think Claire really knocked it out of the park with Clockwork Princess. Claire also at this time was utilizing social media to promote her books a lot. She would release exclusive chapters and talk to her fans on Twitter and I think this dives back into her fanfiction days. I think she had a really close relationship with her readers when she was writing fanfiction and so she was kind of replicating that with her fans now and that just cultivated this parasocial relationship with her that I think helped her have fans that will pretty much read anything she publishes from then on out. In 2013 Claire also released the Shadowhunters Codex which was kind of a bonus content book all about Shadowhunters and apparently there was an app. I didn't even look to see if I could get the app. I wonder if it's still a thing. Okay I don't see a Shadowhunters. There's just the Books Amino networking for Shadowhunters. So okay but apparently there was an app I didn't look into it until now, but I have it in my notes. All of this just kind of kept her on the hype train and things were just going so well for Cassandra Clare. And then in August of 2013, we have the release of the Mortal Instruments City of Bones movie. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I, I mentioned in 2009, Cassandra Clare sold the rights. So they had been working on this pre-production for a while but as early as 2010 Lily Collins was attached to the project to play Clary Frey and they were casting all the way up until production which happened in 2012. They filmed in New York City and in Toronto. There are a few bizarre things that happened around this movie. So all the way in pre-production and promoting the movie, Cassandra Clare was doing interviews gushing about how much involved she was. She loved being involved. She said she stated she was involved in casting and other aspects and it very much seemed reading these interviews it seemed like she had more involvement than normal. One of the biggest kind of controversies that I saw surrounding the movie is actually the casting of Asian actor and model Godfrey Gao as the wizard Magnus Bane. This is literally the most 2012 thing ever but apparently fans were ridiculously vocal and upset about this casting because they had it in their mind that Adam Lambert needed to play this character. And this is something really cool like Cassie actually put her foot down because Magnus is South Asian and is described as Asian in every single book that he appears in. So when Cassie said she had some input when in regards to casting she wanted to make sure that Magnus was not whitewashed. She again wrote a long Tumblr post about this stating that it's really important not to whitewash and this is Magnus and but that that didn't really stop fans from outraging over Adam Lambert not being Magnus Bane. So bizarre. So bizarre. <laughs> there was some other backlash casting around Jamie Campbell Bower as Jace um, but nothing as big as the Godfrey Gao casting and I'm really actually happy that Cassie stepped in and made sure that an Asian actor was cast to play the role of Magnus Bane. Apparently she also wanted to make sure that Alex was not straight washed. I have never heard that term before but she wanted to make sure Alec was gay in the movies because he is in the book. When the movie was actually released it was met with very poor critical and audience reception even though there were some diehard fans that I think went to the premiere nights and were really excited about it. 
they were not happy with the film and critics were not happy with the film either. A couple quotes that I saw criticizing this movie, it says, alas, for every Hunger Games and Harry Potter, there are about 10 YA movie adaptations that make the mistake of trying to cram the plot of a 435 page book into a two hour movie without actually capturing any of the magic that made people want to read those pages. The Mortal Instruments City of Bones released in August has a 12% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Still has, it has a 13% critics review and a 58% audience review. I think the fan and critic reception of this movie kind of took a lot of people by surprise, but it is what it is. And initially the sequel was greenlit and then it was pulled back on. This again has nothing to do with Cassandra Clare, but I do want to mention it because after the critical reception, she started showing a little bit more disdain, not really just like unhappiness, I guess is the best way to put it of the adaptation of her books. From what I've seen, she also kept getting messages from fans who thought she was extremely involved with the project and were asking her things like, why didn't you, why did you let this happen basically? This movie sucked. Why did you let this happen to your books? So because she was so open about her involvement and excited about her involvement, when she started kind of backtracking or not being as supportive of the movie when it didn't gain as much critical success it she started facing a little bit of backlash around that saying she was flip-flopping and so she ended up this garnered enough attention where she ended up writing a long tumblr post about it and she basically states that she did have certain input on certain things and people that she wanted to work with and those specifically being the Alec and Magnus stuff that I mentioned earlier and she was also had the ability to to give notes on the script and on what was going on but she had no control over whether the producers or anybody whoever makes decisions on the movie actually takes those notes and does something with them and so it was really interesting because she did state that at the beginning for all the press she wanted to praise her involvement because she thought there was going to be a second movie she didn't want to alienate the director and at that time she had heard of people and authors who weren't even allowed on set of their adaptations so she really thought she was getting the good end of the deal and in hindsight she does look back and think it was not the greatest deal that she ever made and she actually in an interview with christine from pull and bananas books one of the first things she says is be careful who you sell your movie rights to and kind of gives advice on whether or not you want a lot of control or not a lot of control. You have to be careful about that. It's the 10th year anniversary for City of Bones. I just wanted to ask if you had a piece of advice that you wish you would have known 10 years ago when you first published City of Bones. Um, be careful who you sell your movie rights to. <laughs> would have told myself to be more careful with my rights. I didn't think about things like foreign rights, auxiliary yeah. rights, um, movie rights, TV rights, any of that stuff. And so, you know, how I, like, however I would feel about adaptations of my work, I definitely created a situation where I was not going to be involved. Mm -hmm. And I think I would have gone back and told myself, you know, you'll want to be involved. Yeah. You know, yeah. you'll want, like, you know, I just thought Control. this will never, ever, ever happen. Despite the movie's dismal critical reception, Cassandra Clare was still very much moving forward and still very successful. And in 2014, we enter kind of the next era of her success, I would call it. I think this is kind of when she begins her empire. Some people would argue that maybe with Clockwork Princess, but in 2014, I think City of Hel Heavenly Fire kind of solidified this Shadow Hunter empire. This is the big finale of the Mortal Instruments series that has been going on for nearly a decade. City of Heavenly Fire was received much with much more praise than its counterparts earlier in the series, City of Lost Souls and and City of Fallen Angels. And I think this finale really knitted together the Infernal Devices and the Mortal Instruments. And it really established that it wasn't just book two book series. This was going to be a huge intertwining, interconnected world that she had planned. City of Heavenly Fire 
cemented those fans that would read anything ever and forever and people still talk about her releases up to this day so I think it definitely worked. And again this goes back to while other series are, were falling on their last books and not living up to the hype, Cassandra Clare proved herself a master at finales. Her finales are widely well praised even by people that don't absolutely adore her books like me I don't I'm not like a huge stan of her I definitely think City of Glass, City of Heavenly Fire, Clockwork Princess are definitely some of her better works and also at this time we're seeing huge growth it's been almost 14 years since she started writing fan fiction and 10 years since she started writing the mortal instruments so you are seeing growth as a writer which is only going to serve her for the best between 2014 and 2015, Cassandra Clare would release five books in two years. So we had City of Heavenly Fire in 2014, The Bane Chronicles, which was her first short story collection, as well as Tales from the Shadowhunter Academy, which was a second short story collection. And we also are seeing Clare's first official departure from the Shadowhunter world in her middle grade series with Holly Black, the first book being The Iron Trial and the second book being The Copper Gauntlet. An interesting note in this time as well is pre-production for the Shadowhunters TV show actually began in 2014, which is crazy because I feel like the time between, looking back on my experience, the time between the movie and the TV show seems like years. And it would be a few years before the TV show actually hit TV. But in 2014 is when the pre-production started. So really off the back of the awful movie, people were already thinking about something new to do with her works. In 2016, Cassandra Clare only releases two books. She releases Lady Midnight, the first book in the next series in the Shadowhunter world as well as The Bronze Key which is the third book in the middle grade series with Holly Black. Cassandra Clare is also slapped with a giant lawsuit in 2016. In February of 2016 best-selling adult romance fantasy author Sherilyn Kenyon sues Cassandra Clare for copyright and trademark infringement. In this lawsuit, Kenyon alleges that Claire knowingly and willfully copied elements from her Dark Hunter series to use in her Shadow Hunter series. So you can find the exhibits of this lawsuit online, it's public information, but in an article in, from The Guardian that kind of summarized this lawsuit, it said that Kenyon alleges that both the Dark Hunter and Shadow Hunter books say they are about an elite band of warriors that must protect the human world from the unseen paranormal threat that seeks to destroy humans as they go about their daily lives. They are both given a manual on how to conduct their mission and how to, on how to conduct themselves when dealing with other entities and species in their fictional world. The exhibit continues, both series employ a line of warriors who protect the normal world from demons. In both series, a young person becomes part of the Dark Hunter or Shadow Hunter world after being saved by a gorgeous blonde hair, blonde Dark Hunter or Shadow Hunter. They each must kill their demonic father. Both Dark Hunters and Shadow Hunters have enchanted swords that are divinely forged, imbued with otherworldly spirits, have unique names, and glow like heavenly fire. So according to the lawsuit, Kenyon was alerted by fans in 2006 that there were similarities between Mortal Instruments and the Dark Hunter series and Kenyon reached out, allegedly reached out to Cassandra Clare to ask her to change from Dark Hunter to Shadow Hunter and that was that. However, there's no evidence of that communication and it should have been included in a lawsuit if there was actual communication in my opinion. Even though like what I just said it does sound very similar but a lot of these are ideas and a lot of them are derived from mythology and folklore so you can't really copyright an idea otherwise no one would ever have to write ever be able to write a story ever again and actually I think she's a romance author now Courtney Milan who was actually a former lawyer looked over the case and actually made a statement she said that Sherilyn Kenyon didn't invent the idea of a band of humans fighting the supernatural and she's claiming ownership over the idea that most humans are blind to a supernatural world and are given a name she didn't invent that 95% of what she's claiming are character tropes and journeys and items from our shared literature background. 
literally both stories draw from our collective mythology and his mythological history that's why there are similarities fundamental to the idea of copyright protection is that you can't copyright ideas only the expression of them if you could copyright ideas no one would be able to write anything ever so it didn't look like the lawsuit was going her way. So in May of 2016, Sherilyn Kenyon actually drops the copyright infringement portion of the lawsuit and continues with the trademark portion. Cassie actually responds in 2018 uh, on a Tumblr post with screenshots of the ina inaccuracies and things that were happening in the exhibit and the corrections and all of that stuff. And Cassie actually claims that being sued took a huge toll on her mental health. And it, was, it wasn't until May of 2018 when she actually ended up settling because the process was long, expensive, and very draining on her. However, she does reiterate that the copyright and plagiarism portions of this lawsuit were dropped by Kenyon and she only settled to the trademark even though she doesn't believe that she actually infringed on the trademark. It was just such a long and tedious process that was really getting to her that they advised that she was advised to just settle. I think this garnered again it garnered so much more attention because of the accusations of plagiarism plagiarism that Claire has faced in the past and also honestly probably her fan fiction background I think the there are a lot of people in the general public that view all fan fiction as plagiarism so I'm sure that didn't help at all to begin with but as of May 2018 the trademark portion of the case was settled and the copyright and other plagiarism lawsuit was dropped you know she's no longer being accused of that all right 2016 man i'm so sorry cassie this was a year for you but in 2016 we had the release of the tv show Shadowhunters. Shadowhunters was released in 2016 and it had a pretty shaky pilot. Even though there was a lot of hype surrounding the series, a lot of initial fans believed that a television series could tell the story more in depth than a movie could, so people were excited. However, book fans of the book and Cassandra Clare did not really like the Shadowhunter show. However, it did garner a lot of popularity among people who had never read the books. So there was kind of this divide among Shadow hunters fans there were book fans and show fans and Cassie mostly stays out of the drama as far as I could tell other than answering questions she stated that she was minimally involved and she was disappointed that she was minimally involved this time around she said that the showrunners kind of had their own ideas for the show and took them and ran with it and that's why there were so many changes and she didn't have nearly as much input as she did with the movie there was a little bit of a blip on Cassie's radar in 2017 regarding the show. I guess she had kind of snarked at a fan who was upset with her about the Shadowhunter show and she had to release a long statement about you know why she was upset and how she felt it was unfair that she couldn't say anything negative about her adaptations when Rick Riordan could say all he wanted about his adaptations and how that was unfair and that was kind of the only real big controversy as far as I could tell between Claire and the Shadowhunters show. So I don't want to delve, I'm, I think there was a lot of discourse surrounding the show. I don't want to talk too much about it but the show was cancelled and its final episode aired on May 8th 2019. So Cassie Claire has actually been continuing to, continuing to write within the last five years so between 2017 and 2021 she has released eight books so far. So we had Lord of Shadows in 2017, The Silver Mask with Holly Black in 2017, Queen of Air and Darkness in 2018, The Red Scrolls of Magic in 2019, The Lost Book of the White in 2020, Chain of Gold in 2020, and Chain of Iron in 2021. All except the ones with Holly Black were released within the Shadowhunter world. And she has no intention of slowing down. As far as I could find there are five more planned books like full novels within the Shadowhunters world that she intends to write before wrapping up as far as I know 
completely the Shadowhunters world. So she's got Chain of Thorns, which is the last book in the Last Hours series, The Black Volume of the Dead, which is the last book in The Eldest Curses, and then she has another three book trilogy called The Wicked Powers that don't even have titles yet. So it is safe to say that we will be seeing Cassandra Clare and she will be writing in the Shadowhunter universe for the next, I don't know, five years at least. We're talking a book a year, five years, maybe four. But Cassandra Clare also announced recently that she will be releasing a high fantasy adult series titled Swordcatcher and on her website it says coming 2022 and 2024. There's two books on there right now. Cassandra Clare is one of the biggest not only young adult authors but I would say biggest authors in the world and she has accomplished so much throughout her career and has no intention of slowing down. So I do have to commend her for creating this insane empire of a fictional universe that has just really taken off. I think that's where I want to end it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was really kind of fun looking back at an author with such a long kind of storied history and looking at where she came from and kind of thinking about where she's going. So let me know what your opinions are on the Shadowhunter series and Cassandra Clare down below. Did you read her fan fiction? Are you gonna read that 1600 page fanfic of Draco Malfoy? Honestly, I'm still on the fence about it. I really don't know um, because I'm not a huge fan of the Mortal Instruments series. So going back even further to that sort of Cassandra Clare writing just doesn't really appeal to me. But I also feel like now that I've made this video, I have to, right? Let me know what you think down below. Like this video if you like. And if you like videos like this, I love making them. So I will probably continue to make them in the future. Subscribe if you want to. You do not have to. I I'm just happy that you're here and I will leave you there. Bye! <laughs>